Hello everybody. If you're on Windows 11, you can get Linux graphics on your Windows desktop pretty easily. If you're part of the just say no to Windows 11 crowd like I am, you got to jump through a few hoops. So this is about jumping through those hoops and not just getting Linux graphics on your Windows 10 desktop, getting it from a Linux container under WSL. All right. So step one is to get a program called VCX SRV. That is VCX SRV. There's another one out there called Xming, but this one is a little bit more free and open source. It's also one of the great workhorses of this sort of stuff that is not on GitHub yet. It's on SourceForge, which is like ye old GitHub minus the version control and collaboration and with a lot more advertising but it's a pretty trusted source this is a highly downloaded product highly reviewed and i've used it many times in the past so you need it and it's got an installer it didn't always have an installer but it is a product that's improving so you run it and you run the installer Got to approve the admins. I am going to uh, leave the start menu shortcuts, but delete the desktop shortcuts, and I'll uh, allow it to install its fonts. Sure, why not? X Windows fonts, it's going to be probably pretty important. So we'll go ahead and install. All right, it's an unusual product. It is a little weird to use but I've done it enough times. I know the defaults and I'll just walk you quickly through it and where to put its config file. It's done installing, we close that. So now we can get to it, presumably on the start menu. Did it put it there? All right. So if it doesn't come up on the start menu, where you find it is you bring up your Windows Explorer, you go into a dish computer, your C drive, Program Files, VCX, SRV, there it is. You're going to find two executables in there. You don't want that first one, the actual VCX, SRV. You want the second one called XLaunch. XLaunch is a wizard. It'll walk you through a configuration process, okay? So on this configuration process, some of these options are actually pretty important. You want it on multiple windows. You see this is how it integrates with windows, and we want... Linux software just coming up each app in its own separate window. And then this is the really important one. It says display number and it's set to negative one. That has to become zero. And then next, start with no client. That's the default. That's good. Uh, native OpenGL. It says if you use native OpenGL, you want libgl always in direct environment variable set to one. They don't say that, but it should be set to one. We'll cover that in a moment. But we're basically taking the default. So we hit next. Oh, one thing back here, additional parameters. Just to be sure, I put minus AC. That's for allow all connections, additional parameters. So the hyphen a and C allow all connections. Okay, and then next. And this, this is where you save configuration. I'm going to save it to the desktop initially, but there's an extra trick to make it run on the restart of your, your system all the time. So I'll save configuration. I'll allow it to go right up to the desktop where it's set and it's config. So it's going to be config.xlaunch. We'll, we'll save that there. All right. So I can double click that to run it and I'm, I'm going to do that, but I might as well take care of uh, starting it. Oh, Windows Defender, <clears throat> some important points here. We are going to allow access, allow VCX SRV Windows Server to communicate with these networks, private networks. Okay. You would hope that that's the one that would magically make everything work, but it's not. We're going to have one more firewall rule to deal with. Uh, it's what is a showstopper for so many people trying to do this, right? So this is when we go to my, my notes. Make it big. And um, 
So I point out that this process I'm showing you, anyone can show you these days, how to get Linux graphics under WSL. People have been doing this trick for a few years now. But only I'll show you how to get Linux graphics on Windows under Linux containers. This is an exclusive from me, I believe, as far as I've been able to see. So we've gone as far as saving that config.launch, uh, but we haven't saved it into startup. Everyone has this long directory, you know, your exact uh, words might change. You have to put your username in there, but copy that, minimize this, and bring up uh, an explorer window. Now we just outright paste that into our explorer window and it drops us into our startup location. You see that? It actually worked. You know it worked because it took the address and it's showing it there. This goes in here. We haven't even run it yet, but now it will actually run. Oh, so I it, it did run. Okay, well that's good. So um, on restarts it will run because it's now located here. And in fact, for good measure, I'm going to exit out of that one. And then I am going to double click it from here just to make sure it runs in the exact same context as it would on a restart. And there's our uh, icon back, so we know it's running. Okay. Now comes the firewall rule, the, the really tricky one. Okay, this is what trips most people up. And we have to allow incoming connections from WSL through the Windows firewall. All right, and so you copy this, and I guess I'll, I'll paste this into the video's description. And this is one of those things where it has to be done with admin rights from a PowerShell. So we're going to bring up a PowerShell with run as administrator. All right, you paste that command in. Now, in fact, I might hold off on this because I need to do a before and after to show you this taking effect, right? So we'll keep this around for a minute and we'll jump to some of the other instructions here. And I'm going to walk you through and show you XI's first not popping up for lack of this rule. And then I'll show you XI's popping up because we put that rule in. Okay, I could even show it to you from the user interface, not just the type in interface. Okay, so This is the magic line. Whenever you research this on the internet, this is the one you're going to find, right? And that goes into your bash RC of your Windows subsystem for Linux. All right, bash RC. I say bash RC, I mean bash profile. All right, so we go into the uh, WSL, which is going to automatically forward us into the container. And we did a fresh reboot, so it's double Linux boot up. I'm going to exit out so that I'm no longer in the container and I'm just in WSL. And then I'm going to vim the bash profile. I have an alias set up. I could have just typed profile. Okay. And so now I'm going to uh, go to the top of the file and I'm going to paste in uh, this export command. And that's the magic that finds our name server and stuff and uh, puts it into a, uh, an environment variable. We can print those environment variables. There's a couple more things I'm going to put in there. This one here exports the data from that line above. See, it recycles the uh, variable that we're using. And it copies it to my cloud drive location, right? So if you're following along and you want to make containers have Linux graphics, you're going to have to make sure that you've got a drive that's mapped and accessible from both WSL and containers hosted by WSL, all right? I'll put that there. And then this last piece is the well, one that it said if you're using OpenGL, include this because it gives you faster graphics performance. So we put that in for faster graphics performance. These are the three magic things now. Only two of them are actually required to make it work from WSL. In fact, this will make it work from WSL. This is discretionary and improves graphics performance. And this is discretionary and allows containers to have access to the information that 
uh, the parent uh, uh, Linux has. Okay, right, so we did those, um, those edits. And now finally the container itself needs to import that data that was just exported here. See, I write it to uh, home data display sh, and here I read it from home data display sh with that source thing, which is kind of the same as using a period. And that is all that's in the containers uh, bash rc at the moment. So you'll see that. We'll uh, right quit, go back into drummers. That's an alias for a long command that, you know, does the lxc command for uh, logging into this lxc container. So this is an lxc container we're in, which has its own bash profile. All right, and all it has is, uh, you know, a couple of uh, imports of uh, commands and an export of a uh, display var a variable for screen RC. Well, anyway, we now do one more uh, source running it through a uh, file in order to get that variable right and quit and now we go back to our notes one more time in order to get the tools uh, the x11 app so this is sudo apt install x11 apps when everyone tests this with the little googly eyes with x eyes right so this will um, that certainly won't sudo apt install x11 apps sudo apt install x11 apps and it's a pretty big friggin install and you will notice we're on the container right yes we are on the container doing this we're installing xis on lxd under wsl now it sounds like so much gobbledygook and you know tongue twisters but trust me this is actually pretty cool All right, so the X stuff is pretty much uh, installed now. And the uh, anticlimactic moment is when you make sure you're not covering over the X eyes when they pop up, because that happens a lot. Clear and X eyes. This is the before, can open display, see that? Um, well, anyway, yeah, it actually needs to exit. Uh, its stuff hasn't run. We have to exit both of them. Control Shift W. I need to go back entirely because this is bash profile stuff. So the display exports don't happen until you uh, re-log in. Again, we get it out of the way and we try X eyes. I, I knew it was wrong because of how fast the error came back when it's trying to get through uh, display port zero, which is what's happening here uh, from like WSL side stuff, trying to reach over to uh, the X server here. This is being blocked, right? What's happening now is this can't be reached from this. All right, you get that? And it would time out. So while we're waiting for the timeout, I'm going to bring up that PowerShell again. I'll put it on the same window as where we're operating, and I'll slam it into the lower left corner. And I will go back to my meeting notes. Now I'll pull that firewall rule. Copy. All right, so this will eventually time out, but we don't have to wait. I'll just hit Control C on that. But it clearly didn't work. This, as you'll recall, is PowerShell in administrator mode. That's very important. You can't do firewall rules without being in administrator uh, mode. And uh, I paste it. Ready? Enter. It took it. All right, it scrolled a little bit. You know, it's showing some stuff. And... Uh, X size. There's our X size, right? We'll not find a demonstration as straightforward and smooth and covering all the nuances of this because I've made these little X size come up and do their little googly routine. 
many times over the years. If you Google this topic, I'm one of the ones who comes up over and over. So that's the first X Windows trick. We're going to do another X Windows trick just to hit home that this is important and to clear the way for the coming Jupyter install. Okay, so my friend Scott M, a uh, Bell Research Labs uh, ex employee who was where the action was at, almost like issued a challenge. If you can do the following, well, I'm not going to make this accessible to the network here. It's, I'm keeping this local on my machine, but this next step guarantees that Jupyter's little startup routine where some tokens are passed back and forth will will work. How? By having Firefox present. sudo apt install Firefox. Yes. So this is the Linux version of Firefox I'm installing on Windows, on the Windows subsystem for Linux on a Linux container hosted under the Windows subsystem for Linux. So you're about to see Firefox served from a Linux container running under WSL. Now this can be done with like Docker desktop and stuff. People might be like ho-hum, you know, old news. But honestly, this is like a complete Linux system with uh, the persistence and uh, user space, uh, user space and uh, editable um, system space, uh, privileged, you know, root space. If you become, you know, when you, when you sudo and do changes to the operating system, it stays. So this is like a real developer platform, uh, containerized developer platform under the Windows subsystem for Linux. I might be sounding repetitive, but yeah, it's such a sweet spot to work. And some people might say, um, why not just uh, be on, on Linux going through all this trouble? Well, the answer is the, you know, integrated platform. I'm on a nice laptop. It's going to run all my Linux stuff side by side with the Windows stuff, the world's most popular desktop with the world's most popular server software, all blended together and letting me do my thing. And you don't have to jump through these hoops uh, all the time. You just have to jump through these hoops when you're setting up your tooling, right? A lot of the stuff I'm doing right now is about tooling, right? So we all go through a little bit of tooling pains to get things just so. But if you do your tooling pains and get things such just so in a containerized environment, have dev platform will travel. You could bring this to any machine that can host Linux containers and have your whole dev platform uncompromised, not without the compositing system of Docker and having to write certain things here and certain things there. It's just Linux. <laughs> this is where I consider pausing the video, but so long as I have uh, points to make, I'll just keep let it going. You can see the whole Firefox install. There are different approaches here. When you install the big graphics software, you could do Ubuntu Desktop, you could do the Nautilus File Manager. Uh, there's a number of ways to go about getting all these libraries that are required for graphics software uh, on your system. And there it is, it's done. So clear, Firefox. This is Firefox for Linux right here, my friends. And it's a Linux version of Firefox. Whoops. <laughs> oh, it knew what I wanted. It did a Google search. All right. Now, so there you have it. Um, coming up next, uh, we'll be installing Jupyter uh, in the uh, Debian Ubuntu type way. So. Actually, no, it's not apt install Jupyter. If I remember correctly now, we'll go to the Jupyter uh, home and we'll see their uh, preferred way to install. Try install and uh, there it is. Pip install 
Jupyter Lab. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to pip install uh, Jupyter Lab. Let's see what the options are. Should we do it here? Should we just go for broke, right? Yes, you say. Make it part of this video. No, it's going to be a next video. I'm going to bank my wins. This was a pretty amazing video. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, super pumped about that. Linux graphics on the desktop of Windows 10 uh, from a LXD container. So once again, make sure you understand when I do that, that's not Windows subsystem for Linux directly. It is indirectly that, but it is having run LXD containers, which you can tell by looking at my bash RC, my bash profile, because the first thing it does when it uh, logs into the Windows subsystem for Linux, not the first thing it does, or the last thing it does, is it subsequently logs into an instance of a container. All right. That container is called drummers. And from drummers, we can run XIs. Firefox. Ta da! And this will be useful in getting Jupyter running properly as a server Linux side because this will allow some magic token passing that it does to occur and uh, get our Windows side access of Jupyter uh, nice and smoothed out for Scott M. I do a little bit of hocus pocus. Not exactly what he asked for. Uh, but in my book, this really uh, hits it on the spot. So thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.